Hello everyone, welcome to the daily newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar AS Academy today 19th November 2024. Displayed here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss. The first article, more efficient methods of tracking stubble burning needed, says expert. This article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. The second article, Rio G20 is taking forward people-centric decision taken during India Mint. This article is taken from the newspaper The Indian Express. And the third article, regulating fossil fuel like nuclear weapons. This article is talking about a concept called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. We will be discussing that and this article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. We also have one more article. The fourth article is about SpaceX Falcon 9 deploys Indian satellite into orbit. This article is talking about the launch of GSAT-20, a satellite developed by the Indian Space Research Organization and got deployed by Falcon 9, a rocket developed by the SpaceX company. And this is a first collaboration between India, ISRO and the SpaceX. So, and this article is taken from the newspaper The Hindu. So, without much delay, let us get into our newspaper discussion. Before getting into our newspaper discussion, we have an important announcement from Shankar IS Academy. Pre-storming UPSC Prelims Test Series 2025, batch 3rd will be starting on 21st November 2024. We know that every year the prelims are getting tougher. So, practicing more questions is the only solution for overcoming uh, difficulty. Therefore, do register for the program and take the test. The link for the registration will be given in the description. We also have one more announcement. This is regarding the Chakra initiative of Shankar IS Academy. Chakra is exclusively focusing on current affairs. We know the importance of current affairs in both prelims as well as mains. More details about this program will be given as a brochure in the description. Go through this and register for the program. Look at this newspaper article taken from the newspaper Indian Express. Rio G20 taking forward people-centric decisions taken during India meet Prime Minister. So, this article is talking about the G20 meeting which is currently happening in Brazil and in that meeting, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi has highlighted the achievements of India in various fields such as women empowerment, social development, poverty reduction as well as food security. And at the same time, he also highlighted the certain uh, issues, challenges faced by the global south. So, in this background, let us discuss more about the G20 from the prelims point of view. Before moving into G20, we have to understand the difference between G20, G8 and G7. We often see this in newspapers, right? G7 means it includes seven countries. They are Canada, Italy, Germany, France, Japan, United Kingdom and the United States. G8 means G7 plus one country that is Russia. And coming to the case of G20, it includes G7, G, G8 plus other countries such as Argentina, Australia, Brazil, European Union, India, China, Indonesia, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Turkey and South Africa. At present, G20 has 19 countries plus European Union. Let us move to the origin of the G20. The origin of the G20 can be traced back to the 1999. We know the importance of 1999. That 98-99 is known as the period of Asian financial crisis. Asian financial crisis. So, this time the entire uh, Asia, especially the Southeast Asia and the South Asia was severely affected. And that time the governors of the central banks from these nations and the financial ministers from these nations met in, in the German city called Berlin, the capital of Germany. And that was the foundation for the G20. And the objective of that meeting was to address the global financial crisis. And later in 2007-8, there was another financial crisis uh, that affected across the world. Therefore, an elevated leader level meeting was held and that formally established the G20. Like I said, at present, it has 19 countries plus European Union. So, this is a brief overview about the G20. Coming to the objectives of the G20, like, like all other major forums, it also looking to promote economic growth and stability among the nations and address various global challenges such as climate change, health and trade. For example, it is allocating uh, fund for, for climate resilient infrastructure. At the same time, during the time of COVID pandemic, the G20 gave certain relaxations for the developing nations to repay their debt. And, uh, and the next major objective is foster inclusive and sustainable growth. For example, in G20, uh, Brazil meeting that is in 2024 meeting the Brazil launched uh, an initiative called the global alliance against the poverty and the hunger India ensured its support to the alliance. So these are the uh, best examples of the uh, initiatives 
comes under the sustainable development and the next major initiative is reform financial systems such as providing relaxations to uh, developing and underdeveloped nations to repair their, their debt at the same time the major reason behind the origin of this g20 itself is the financial crisis so therefore reforming financial systems are the another major initiative of or objectives of the g20 and coming to the organizational structure the the presidency of the g20 will be rotating every year for example in 2023 india had the presidency and in that presidency we highlighted our principle called the vasudeva kudumbagam right and, uh, uh, and the decision making body the annual g20 leader summit is the central decision making body and it is working on thematic areas such as trade and climate just now we discussed and engagement groups what are the other groups or entities cooperating with the g20 that includes youth civil society and business communities moving on to the key initiatives certain key initiatives of g20 it includes compact with africa this was launched in 2017 under the presidency of germany to boost private investment in africa and then we have the global methane pledge this was launched in the year 2021 the major objective of the scheme is to cut the methane emission by 30 percentage from 2022 and that objective should be achieved before 2030 anyhow india and china are not part of this pledge and the next major initiative is the debt service suspension that is providing a relaxation uh, to the developing and underdeveloped nations uh, during the time of pandemic and as a part of this debt service suspension initiative uh, the uh, the g20 nations suspended near, uh, nearly a debt of dollar 12 billion for 48 nations during the time of pandemic this was a great relief for them and the next major initiative is coral rescue initiative we know coral community is another major uh, habitat which is severely affected due to the present accelerated climate change therefore coral rescue initiative this was launched in the year 2022 under the presidency of australia the objective of the uh, initiative is to protect 75 percentage of coral reef what are the contributions made by india in the g20 so we are like i said we had the presidency in the year 2023 and we addressed the principle that is one earth one family one future and we can simply say that it is vasudeva kudumbagam which is focusing on sustainable development and inclusive growth because in the 2023 um, g20 meeting india highlighted the importance of poverty and hunger eradication at the same time uh, the importance of digital infrastructure and we also launched a global biofuel alliance in the g20 meeting 2023 that is for accelerating biofuel adoption for example uh, promotion of ethanol its so contribution is the voice of the global south summit because we know that even in uh, in this year g20 india highlighted the challenges faced by the global south regarding such as such as inflation and fertilizer crisis and all and the international year for millets the year 2023 was declared as the international year of millets highlighting the importance of um, the millets in in achieving the nutritional security because we know that millet has a lot of nutritional factors at the same time it is it is resilient to adverse climate conditions such as drought and all therefore millets will have a great future in the upcoming days in ensuring the nutrition security and india was the major power in the world that advocated for the adoption of millets in the diet therefore international year of millet was declared in the year 2023 and then is the mission life that is promoting sustainable lifestyles among the uh, individuals for example this will be very useful in tackling modern problems such as health issues for example the non-communicable diseases such as uh, diabetes and hypertension and other cardiovascular issues the best example is promotion of yoga this is the map of south america and this is brazil we know that and this year g20 was happened in brazil only therefore we can expect a 2025 upsc prelims question from uh, regarding the map of brazil because usually UPSC will ask such questions for example in 2022 prelims the UPSC asked uh, uh, a question uh, regarding the boundary of Afghanistan so this year this this G20 meeting is a major event therefore we can expect a map based question from this area so you can see Brazil shares its boundary with almost every nation in in South America except Ecuador and Chile so remember this except Ecuador and Chile Brazil shares its boundary with all other south american nation so remember this fact this can be useful in your upsc 2025 prelims so in this topic we discussed the g20 its objectives the contributions made by india to the g20 and what are the key initiatives taken by the g20 so with this background try to answer this prelims practice question 
The question is with reference to the G20, consider the following statements. Statement 1, all G7 countries are members of G20. Statement 2, the G20 does not have a permanent secretary. Statement 3, the 2023 G20 presidency was held by India. Which of the statements given above is or are correct? Option A, 1 and 2 only. Option B, 2 and 3 only. Option C, 1 and 3 only. And option D, 1, 2 and 3. The correct answer is option D. All the three statements are correct. 1, 2, 3. All the three statements are correct. Now, let us move to our next topic. So, look at this newspaper article taken from the newspaper Indian Express regulating fossil fuel like nuclear weapons. This article is talking about a concept called the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, which again became a matter of discussion in the current COP29 climate summit which is happening in Azerbaijan's capital Baku because certain governments and the civil societies are pushing for the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. So what is this pro fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty? So to understand about this fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, we have to understand what is mean by non-proliferation treaty. What is prolif non-proliferation treaty? We know that in the post-war period, the global order was influenced by the developments in the field of nuclear weapons and nuclear technologies. So, we know that during the time of war, uh, America developed the nuclear weapon uh, through the operation called Operation Trinity. We might have seen the movie called Oppenheimer directed by Christopher Nolan, right? So, that movie shows how nuclear weapon was developed in America and followed by that America experimented this nuclear weapon in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we know that and after that different nations started developing their own nuclear weapons and technologies. For example, USSR developed, Britain developed, France developed and by late 1950s almost all, every superpowers had their own nuclear weapons and technologies and this created uh, a kind of fear among the between the nations at the same time the nation started behaving more skeptical in uh, in their relations and therefore to prevent because we know the the catastrophic potential of the nuclear weapons therefore the nations decided to reduce the expansion of the nuclear weapons and therefore as a result of this in in the year 1968 uh, the the nation signed and their allies also signed a treaty called the non proliferation treaty the objective is prevention of the expansion of the nuclear weapons and call for a global peace but this non proliferation treaty had an unjust character because already the powerful nations already developed the nuclear weapons and they are saying that the nuclear weapons should not uh, expand and therefore this unjust character was questioned by india and that's why india is not a party to this non proliferation treaty remember this point india is not a party to this non proliferation treaty and also that we know india it's uh, developed nuclear weapons and uh, also held a nuclear experiment called uh, operation buddha in the 1970s so this is the brief history of the uh, non proliferation treaty coming to the fossil fuel non proliferation treaty it was an idea which was first conceptualized in the year 2016 followed by the landmark paris agreement we know the paris agreement agreement was a significant event because it called for a lot of you know climate initiatives such as reduction of the global temperature below uh, 2 degrees celsius and uh, efforts to achieve global temperature 1.5 degrees celsius above the pre-industrial level and these are the initiatives and also in this initiatives different nations announced their own nationally determined contributions to fight the ongoing climate change and all so this was a landmark event and followed by that the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty was emerged the idea was emerged and in 2019 it was officially launched and at present the nations in the southern pacific regions are the uh, you know the propagators or the uh, they are taking the leadership for uh, for the implementation of this fossil fuel non proliferation treaty so let us discuss more about this so fossil fuel non proliferation treaty the objective is to manage fossil fuel production and usage the inspiration is the non proliferation treaty of 1968 we already discussed what is the principle that means preventing the expansion of nuclear weapons so in the case of non so in the case of fossil fuel non proliferation treaty the objective is objective is prevention of the expansion of fossil fuels and therefore it is seeking international cooperation to phase out the green uh, the fossil fuels which is responsible for the uh, emission of the greenhouse gases and uh, like i said the objective is limit the global warming to 1.5 degrees celsius above the pre-industrial level and end the global dependence on the fossil fuel for energy generation and the principle of the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is standing on three pillars first one is the non-proliferation second one is the phase out and third one is the just transition first principle is non-proliferation that means re uh, reducing the dependency on fossil fuel and reducing the expansion of the uh, fossil fuel through various initiatives and second one is the phasing out of the 
fossil fuel that means based on the historic uh, you know rate of the historical emission based on the nation's economic capacity different nations will have uh, can take different initiatives to slowly phase out the fossil fuel and the third principle is just transition that means the 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 transition should be just because uh, the transition should not affect any communities or any working class for example if you are going for a sudden transition to the green sorry, green energy then it will affect the workers working in the industrial sectors especially in the sector of iron and steel and mine therefore the transition should be just and therefore to have a just transition we need a proper planning and implementation of policies and now we are going to see the goals the climate goals supported by the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty the first major climate goal will be paris agreement it was the it was a landmark event of 2015 and the major objectives we already discussed the reducing the global temperature below 2 degrees celsius and achieving the global temperature of 1.5 degrees celsius above the pre-industrial level for example if the pre-industrial level uh, global temperature is just take 10 degrees celsius the uh, the objective of the paris agreement is to achieve the global temperature 11.5 degrees celsius i hope you understand so this is uh, this is a objective of Paris Agreement and also it is uh, calling for the uh, the gradual phase out of the fossil fuel therefore uh, it also uh, standing with the Paris Agreement to and the third major uh, um, initiative of the Paris Agreement was to uh, was it uh, it acknowledged that 75 percentage of the and the Paris Agreement acknowledged that uh, the greenhouse gases are uh, responsible for 75 percentage of global carbon dioxide emissions so this uh, non-proliferation treaty of fossil fuel is supporting the gradual phase out therefore it is through this it is supporting the third major objective of paris agreement and the second uh, goal will be new collective quantified goal and it it it, it is becoming a major a matter of discussion in the cop29 we already done a video uh, on this new collective quantified goals and uh, how this will uh, support the climate initiatives of developing and underdeveloped nations that we discussed we already done an editorial uh, session on that uh, do watch that video and the major objective of the new collective quantified goal is to scale up the climate finance beyond the 100 degree billion annually so this will be very useful for developing and underdeveloped nations and the uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty is also supporting the global carbon budget defined by the inter panel on climate change that is ipcc so according to IPCC, they are saying that if there is no intervention, then definitely the current fossil fuel reserve will lead to an excess of 3000 gigaton of carbon dioxide emission. Therefore, the non-proliferation treaty of the fossil fuel is also supporting the carbon budget initiative of the IPCC. And at the same time, coming to the uh, SDG goals, sustainable development goals, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty will be supporting the implementation of uh, sustainable development goal number seven which is calling for affordable and renewable energy promotion and the next sustainable development goal is number 13 which is calling for better climate action and the next will be goal number eight which is promoting decent employment opportunity and a decent employment ambient through promoting green energy so these are the goals supported by the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty so in this topic we discussed what is new what is uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and what are its objectives and how it is supporting the global climate action so let us discuss a prelims practice question the question is with reference to the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty consider the following statements statement one the treaty aims to end the expansion of the fossil fuel production globally statement two it is a legally binding under the united nations framework convention on climate change and statement three one of its pillars focuses on ensuring a just transition to transition for dependent for communities dependent on fossil fuels which of the statements given above is or are correct option a one and two only option b one and three only option c two and three only and option d one two and three let's see the correct answer the correct answer is option b b one and three only statement two is in, incorrect it is not yet legally it is not yet a legally binding treaty and it is working outside the framework of the united nations convention on climate change so that's why the statement two goes wrong here the correct answer is option b statement one and three only now we will move to our next article look at this newspaper article taken from the newspaper the hindu more efficient methods of tracking stubble burning needed says experts so this article is talking about indirectly talking about the present air quality in delhi because we know that the air quality index score of delhi is around 
above 400 and it is highly deteriorating and the recently the government introduced GRAP that is Graded Response Action Plan Phase 3 and now they are going for Phase 4, severe restrictions. But this article is saying that in the last 5 years and stubble burning we know that the burning of the crop residue after harvest. So, we discussed what is stubble burning and what are the issues in many videos. And But this article is saying that there is a decline in the stubble burning activities in the last 5 years. But recently, the researchers found that even though there is a decline in the stubble burning in the last 5 years, still the aerosol is high in the atmosphere. And this is pointing towards the efficiency of methods for tracking stubble burning. For example, let us imagine that there are many places, a stubble burning is happening in this region. So, this stubble burning is happening uh, between the time of 1 to 2 pm and that time there was no satellite uh, coming around to monitor this and this burning came to an end by 2.30 and that time a satellite comes here and uh, it, uh, it monitors and it finds that there is no uh, stubble burning activity. So, this kind of issues are there even in the modern technological even in the modern technology that we are using for tracking stubble burning. So, this is the matter highlighted in this article. So, let us discuss what are the technical challenges we have in tackling the problem of stubble burning. The first major challenge is the high cost, high cost for machineries such as happy seeders. Happy seeders are the machineries which can be used for sowing the seeds even without removing or clearing the crop residue. So, these kind of machineries are not affordable for majority of the farmers because majority of the farmers are small and marginal farmers in India. And second one is the short turnaround time that is a narrow window that means a time between the paddy to wheat cultivation is very narrow. Once you harvest the paddy then you have to go for the wheat cultivation and the time gap between these two cultivation is very narrow therefore uh, the farmers will always look for easy methods to remove the residue. And the third major challenge is the lack of awareness. That is, the farmers may not have uh, uh, knowledge about the sustainable practices to manage the crop residue. And the next major challenge is limited storage. That means, uh, we do not have adequate infrastructure to convert the collected uh, or the, uh, the crop residue uh, to useful bioenergies and all these uh, infrastructures we are lacking. Therefore, this is another major reason behind the, this is another major technical challenge. And next is the logistical challenges. The, this includes high cost of collection, transportation and the processing of the um, crop residue to useful matters such as bioenergy. And the uh, next uh, challenge is the weak enforcement of law. This has two effects. First, uh, the, if we cannot monitor the implementation, then the, the created law will be, uh, you know, will become meaningless in bringing effective changes and the next effect will be uh, the penalties or the punishments can deteriorate, can deter the farmers from uh, going back to the cultivation. So, these kind of challenges are there especially in the case of enforcement of law. Now, we are going to see certain initiatives taken by the government to manage the crop residue. The first one is the legislative and policy measures. Then This includes the Air Act of 1981. This punishes and penalizes the people who are polluting the air. And then we have the national policy for uh, policy for the management of crop residue, which was launched in the year 2014. And this is calling for uh, the promotion of in situ and ex situ uh, management of crop residue. And then we have the technology based resolution. For example, the happy seeder we discussed in the beginning. That means uh, we, if we have happy, happy seeder, we can seed, uh, we can sow the seed even without clearing the field. And at the same time, we also have other biological uh, technologies such as PUSA uh, decomposer. PUSA decomposers. So, this decomposer can be used for uh, decomposing the crop residue. And next is the financial support. The best example is, is the submission on agricultural machinization. We can also say SA, SMAM. This is providing subsidies for purchasing crop residue management uh, machineries. And then we have the farmers incentives that means pro providing cash providing cash incentives can promote the farmers to adopt a better sustainable crop residue management processes and then we have the bioenergy project the major objective from the name itself we know that conversion of the crop residue into biomass energy and, and the best example is satet this scheme is looking to convert the uh, crop residue into bio cng especially from the agricultural way and then we have the ethanol blending program. So, under this program, uh, the, the crop residue can be converted into second generation 
ethanol which can be used as a fuel and this ethanol can be blended with a, a particular portion of this ethanol can be blended with the petroleum which will give a clean energy that is less polluted. So, these are the major initiatives taken by the government to promote the, uh, the sustainable management of crop residue in India. So, in this topic we discussed what are the technical challenges in addressing uh, the the problem of the problem of crop residue management and what are the initiatives taken by the government of india to encourage sustainable practice of crop residue management so in this background let us try to answer a prelims practice question so the question is consider the following statements regarding the ethanol blending program in india statement one the ethanol blending program aims to achieve 20 percentage ethanol blending in petrol by 2025 statement two pad is true and agriculture waste can be used to produce second generation ethanol and statement 3 statet scheme is is associated with the promotion of bioethanol production in india which of the statements given above is or are correct option a 1 and 2 only option b 2 and 3 only option c 1 and 3 only and option d 1 2 and 3 the correct answer is option a 1 and 2 only statement 3 is incorrect because the satat scheme is not associated with the promotion of bioethanol it is associated with the bio cng so the statement goes wrong here again in this topic we discussed the technical challenges and what are the initiatives taken by the government of india to promote sustainable residue management look at this newspaper article taken from the newspaper the hindu spacex falcon 9 deploys indian satellite into orbit this newspaper article is talking about a successful space collaboration between the spacex company and the indian space research organization and as a result of the collaboration the falcon 9 the rocket developed by the SpaceX company launched the GSAT N2 or Geostationary Satellite N2 or Geostationary Satellite 20 developed by the Indian Space Research Organization. And this collaboration was facilitated by the commercial arm of Indian Space Research Organization that is the New Space India Limited. So, let us discuss more about this article. First, we will start with the basics about the GSAT N2. So, it is a geostationary satellite. So, what is meant by geostationary satellite? Geostationary satellites are the satellites which will look or appear stationary when we observe from the ground. For example, imagine that this is the earth and this is the equator. And this geostationary satellites will be launched over the equator at an altitude of 35,786 kilometer. And this will appear stationary because it will be rotating along with the planet earth. Therefore, whenever at any time if you observe the satellite from the ground, it will appear stationary. So, that is why it is known as geostationary satellite. And this geostationary satellite will complete one rotation around the planet in an hour of 24 hours, same time taken by the planet Earth. And the average speed of this geostationary N2 is 3.07 km per second. So, these are the basic features of the geostationary satellite N2. And coming to another basic major feature of geostationary satellite N2 will be the use of K band. So, what is mean by K band? We will discuss that. The use of K band high throughout communication satellite. So, K band, to understand the K band, we have to understand about a concept called the electromagnetic spectrum. So, what do you mean by electromagnetic spectrum? Electromagnetic spectrum is a table or index which uh, shows the ranges of different electromagnetic radiations and that can be classified based on its frequency into different categories for example radio wave microwave infrared visible light ultraviolet radiations x-ray and gamma rays so in this way we can divide the radiations into different categories and uh, there are subcategories and this ka band or the k band will be coming under microwave radiations because the frequency of this k band will be between 26 to 40 gigahertz so what is the major feature of this k band the using or the application of this k band will provide you a more accurate data from the earth because it can penetrate through lot of obstacles including cloudy including rainy clouds or other vegetation uh, obstacles such as vegetations so this is the major feature of the or this is the major benefit of using the k band and it is developed by isr we already said it and it is a first collaboration between the india and the spacex company and then we have the launch vehicle that is the Falcon 9. So, not this uh, name of the launch vehicle. This can be a prelims question. And this launch vehicle will be placing the satellite uh, in the geosynchronous transfer orbit. And from there, it will occur the nature of geostationary satellite. Coming to the purpose of this satellite, it will enhance the broadband services, provide connectivity to remote areas. Therefore, it will enhance India's digital mission through enhancing the 
rural connectivity and enable in flight communication in flight connectivity in indian airspace region for example this will be very useful in avoiding air accidents at the same time will be useful in disaster management coming to the technical features of gsat 20 it uses the k wide band transponders we already discussed what is the benefit of this and it employs multiple spot beams and frequency reuse technology and this supports small user terminal for a large subscriber base and the mass coming to the weight of this satellite it is around 4 ton the, the exact weight is 4700 kg that's why scientists called it as Bahubali and the mission life of the satellite is 40 years therefore it will also support it has a potential to support the upcoming space programs of India because we know that we have a lot of things to do in space and uh, we are developing an exclusive space station for India so we are, we are expecting that will be happening in another 10 years definitely this will support that so the next major concept from the news is the new space india limited it is a commercial arm of indian space research organization it acts as a bridge between the indian space research organization and markets within india as well as in global level and it is established in the year 2019 and the administration of this new space india limited is currently under the department of space and it is headquartered in the bangalore karnataka and the major missions or the responsibilities of the uh, new space india limited are facilitating uh, satellite ownership and the next major responsibility is launch services that means sale of indian launch vehicles such as polar satellite launch vehicle and the gslv that is that is geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle so providing the sale or facilitating the sale of these vehicles are another responsibility responsibility undertaken by the new space india limited and the third major responsibility is technology transfer to indian industries that is pro through issuing uh, intellectual property license and also promotion of the utilization of indian space potential in different sectors such as government offices health disaster management and defense so these are the major responsibilities of the new space india limited so in this topic we discussed what is gsat n2 or gsat 20 and then we discussed its basic features its technical aspect and its technical aspects then we discussed uh, new space india limited and its basic features so with this understanding try to answer this prelims practice question the question is new space india limited operates under which department we already discussed option a ministry of electronics and information technology option b department of, department of science and technology option c department of space and option d defense ministry the correct answer we already said department of space it is the correct answer with this we are coming to the conclusion for this video if you like the video hit the like button and also give your feedbacks as comments and share this content with your friends and before leaving this channel don't forget to subscribe and also hit the bell icon to receive on-time update thank you have a nice day